work session of the Cuyahoga County Council for June 14th, 2011. I'd like to welcome all of our guests here um, this afternoon. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Calling the roll, Mr. Germana? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Schron? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Rogers? Here. Ms. Simon? Ms. Simon is absent. Ms. Conley? Here. Mr. Greenspan? Here. Mr. Miller? Present. Mr. Brady? Present. Uh, before we start our presentations, I would like to introduce Ms. Vanessa Whiting, who is our nominee for the um, Metro Health um, Board. Um, she is welcome to stay until our regular meeting at 6 o'clock, but if you choose not to stay, we will excuse you. Um, but thank you very, very much for coming in. Okay. And also, Mr. Patrick Sweeney, who was with us down at Cleveland State. Nice to have you with us. All right, the uh, first item on the agenda is the Medical Mart update uh, for Mr. Applebaum, who now owes us all shoe shines uh, <laughs> for the... <laughs> For the tour we had this afternoon. You'll notice I wore boots. I, yeah, you were smart enough. And right. jeans. Okay. And jeans. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, present this update, and I think this will be a, a good update because uh, I'm going to build a little bit of, upon what most of you got to see today. So this will it'll almost be like a review session since you were able to spend time out in the site. But just to go through some critical uh, things today, and I'm going to skip over this. This is the same project summary that I showed you last time as a reminder, but uh, the good news is, is nothing has changed. It is the same project, uh, and uh, we are still uh, completely on board uh, uh, the same way that we were uh, when I talked to you last six weeks ago. Uh, design update. Uh, the, uh, we're at the stage of design now where a, uh, a set of 75% design documents uh, were issued uh, in the beginning of May. We've spent a significant amount of time in the month of May uh, going through, pouring through the design documents. On behalf of the county, it was uh, my organization, Project Management Consultants, and uh, Conventional Wisdom, our uh, Convention Center consultant, uh, an operational consultant. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a lot of previous comments. We went through, saw how the comments were uh, incorporated into these drawings, uh, MMPI, uh, LMN Architects, the Bridging Architect, uh, that, says, that should say Turner. I was. I was rushed uh, from the site. Turner, I'll change that, and URS and their consultants. Everybody was involved. We had three days of continuous nonstop meetings, and now we have a process based on everything that we talked about of continually meeting, conforming the drawings, so we're right in the middle of that design process right now. Uh, there will be uh, presentations before uh, the city design review and city planning uh, on the 16th and 17th. Uh, you're gonna hear in a little while, uh, at least from Mr. Coyne, uh, I don't know if Linda is going to speak, uh, but I'll let, let you introduce Linda. And you might also, uh, when you speak, talk just, if you could just say a, a couple words about the uh, design review uh, and planning process, that might be helpful. I would tell you about the process, but since the process is here, I'll let the process speak for itself. Um, um, we also worked uh, with finalizing uh, public auditorium separation and west facade restoration issues with the city. Linda Hendrickson from the city, by the way, is intimately involved in working with us through those issues. She, she represents the city in those discussions, but we believe that we are, uh, I'll look at your face, but I believe that we're basically done and have all those issues resolved. Uh, if she shook her head, yes, I'll be happy. I'm facing this way now. Um, construction update. Uh, we are still on schedule for an August 31, 2013 substantial completion. Nothing has changed. We have lost no time in the schedule. Uh, we're right, right where we need to be. The project is 11% complete uh, based on billings to date for work in place and stored materials. For those of you who are out there, you know we've demolished all those buildings, done all the pre-construction. You can see the enormous amount of effort. Uh, what you're seeing, though, up till now is about 11% of the entire effort, just to give you a feeling for how much there is to go in this thing. Uh, there's a total of 52 bid packages on the project. Uh, 26 have now been awarded. We still have more than half of the bid packages to uh, complete design and award. So that tells you where we are in the award process. Uh, we're also still on schedule to receive uh, LEED uh, Silver certification. Uh, everything that we need to get that certification uh, still is in place. So that is all working extremely well. Uh, so 
Uh, I'm going to now give you a visual construction update. And since you, uh, some of you, and by the way, it, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be as though you were there. Uh, and since uh, some of you uh, were able to see this uh, at ground level, I'm going to actually do this from an aerial shot and try to fit this all together for you so you can actually put together what you saw at the ground with what's really going on out there. So this first shot, and this is an aerial shot that we brought closer, what you're now looking at is uh, the corner uh, where the medical mart is located, the southwest uh, corner of the site uh, where the medical mart will be, and I'm going to just point out a few things, and this is current as of the 9th, and you actually saw progress beyond this today, so there's some places I'm going to show you where more things have occurred uh, in the last few days. So what you see right there, that is the mud mat for, and that mat will actually eventually extend all the way over from here all the way over to the other side of the site. That is the mat. That's the foundation pad for the Medical Mart building itself. The Medical Mart is not on deep foundations. It doesn't need to be on deep foundations. But that mat will eventually extend all the way over to the other side, all the, all the way north, and then there'll be concrete on top of that, and that will form the, the mat foundation for the project. That's at elevation around 646, and I'm going to give you some differences. Uh, when everything is on top of that, that'll be uh, a little higher than that. That's basically at the same as street level. And that's the foundation pad for the medical mart. Um, that little indentation, if you can see it there, that's actually the elevator pit. You have to go down and have a pit there for the elevator. That's where it'll be. But that will extend all the way across the site, and that will be the foundation pad uh, for the medical mart building itself. Um, what you see there, and you saw this if you were out on the site, you saw a large earth retention system, a large wall there, because on the west side of that, you're up at, at a higher elevation. On the east side of that, as you're going to see in a minute, we're at a much lower elevation, so that's an earth retention system. Below ground, there's permanent sheeting there, which will always remain there. Above ground, there's soldier pile and lagging, which eventually will come out. That's temporary. Uh, if you look down here, you see a backhoe, uh, if you can see where the red arrow is. Now they're, they're excavating there, and that excavation gets down to an elevation 617. So basically, they're going down another 30, 33 feet there, and that is the elevation, uh, the, you know, the, the bottom, if you will, of the exhibit hall. So that shows you the differential as you get down to the exhibit hall level. And that's why you need that earth retention system there, because you have that differential. Uh, what you see to the right of it, you see that backhoe is now loading into a truck to remove the dirt. Now, when you were, and, and by the way, that, what you see right there where it says demo 98% complete, that wall existed uh, as of a week ago uh, up at that level, and that is an old, uh, that's part of the old 113 building. Today, that's already gone, and there's actually uh, additional sheeting from the original building that's below that now that shows up there. But that demolition on the site is basically 98% complete throughout the site. Now, so if you focus on where it shows the loading of the dirt on the bottom of that picture, I'm now going to go, and this is kind of what you saw today. This is the movement of trucks around the site. So what we just saw where they were loading, that's now in the upper left-hand corner. That's that, the same picture. Uh, it's just extended. So that is the backhoe loading the truck. And what you see here, all the trucks down on the bottom here, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five of them lined up. Those are the empty trucks, and they're coming around in sort of a figure eight pattern is how this works, and they're lining up ready to take the dirt from that excavation activity. Here you see the full trucks. They've come around, and now you see one, two, three, four, five, six trucks. They're loaded, and they're on their way north to exit the site. Now, when we were on the site, we talked a lot about caisson construction. And uh, just to review, what you learned today was that the, the major activity going on on the site is the installation of these massive caissons. And you recall that these things go down 140 feet because the bedrock is 140 feet below. And what you see here uh, on the bottom are those big steel casings we saw on the site, anywhere from three and a half to five feet in diameter, those big thick casings, uh, 40 to 50 feet in length. And what occurs here, and we'll see it in a minute, is you have the drilling rig drills down 50 feet, inserts one of these steel casings, inserts it in a, in a slurry uh, so that the pressure, the slurry inside, which is a water material mix, so the pressures are equalized. 
uh, they put a, the first top casing in, goes down 40 feet or so, 40 or 50 feet. Then when they get that down, they drill through it another 40 or 50 feet, take another one of these casings, smaller in diameter, fit it down, go down to about 100 feet. Uh, the slurry is still in there. Then they put the third casing in all the way down to the bottom. And remember, you saw that rig, which I'll show you in a minute, with the, with the Kelly bar, turns it, locks it into the rock. So now we have this telescoping casing, uh, 140 feet deep, locked into the rock at the bottom. And then they put the rebar cage in. And uh, you saw on the site, and you can't see it well here, but you walked by it. I think we pointed it out. That's the rebar cage, as you saw, sitting there. The, the reinforcing steel is put in. And then they pour concrete in uh, from the top, but they have a, what's called a tremie tube. So the concrete goes all the way down to the bottom, goes from the bottom up, fills up the hole. And now I have this incredible stilt 140 feet into bedrock up on the top. And that becomes uh, the, the critical foundation piece or, uh, for, for the heaviest loads. We have other types of foundations, two micropiles, but that's the major activity you saw today on the site. So if we go over, and I've now gone a little bit further north, and you saw these rigs because they were there today. So th there's the caisson installation activity. The two yellow machines are the, the machines with the auger that drill down, uh, auger the material out. You saw the pile of muck that came up out of the auger. Uh, so they drill down, and they will also install and lock in uh, the, uh, the casing. Uh, uh, put in the rebar uh, with the crane, lock in the casing, and that is the operation going on right now. This said three, as of today, there have been four of these uh, caissons installed. Uh, it took a little time to get the first one to get the procedure down. Now it's down, it's running, and we're in good shape on schedule, and now we're going to continue to install these until we get 66 of them installed 140 feet deep. And that's the operation that you primarily saw today. Um, uh, I also pointed out and you, you would have seen this on the north side, and it's on both sides of Lakeside Avenue here, that existing wall. Uh, what you see up there is the existing wall, and that's the existing wall structure right now from uh, the old convention center. What was necessary to do here was to excavate to the west of that, so there's a massive excavation which is now covered with that blue material for weather protection. Uh, that is to avoid lateral pressures. Now keep in mind that one thing that has to occur here, and that goes the entire length of the convention center. In order to accommodate um, the, the, uh, the season for the Browns, uh, and I'm going to show you in a minute, there's steps there that go to Brown Stadium that always existed. Uh, we have agreed, if we can get uh, with an agreement that we put in place, we have agreed uh, to put stairs back. We've actually agreed to fill that back in for the construction phase so there's temporary access, <coughs> at least on the right-hand side, from Lakeside Avenue over to the stairs, over to the Browns. Uh, that's subject to an agreement that we are trying to finalize with the city and the Browns to have that pedestrian access way. But that's all got to be backfilled before the football season in order for people to come off of Lakeside Avenue and actually walk across that area uh, in, a, in an area that we will provide to have access to the football games. Uh, and that's that, that area I just talked about. Um, you also saw, uh, and we went underneath uh, Lakeside, and you may recall, and it looks small here, but you remember how large it was when you were underneath it. You saw the massive uh, beams that were now holding up Lakeside Avenue on the north side here. Uh, those actually, this is great recycling. Those used to be the roof beams uh, from, from the ballroom. Uh, they've come down, and they're now being used. They've been jacked up as temporary structure under Lakeside Avenue. The reason for that is that's where the new loading dock is going to be and we have to lower the area there in order to have a loading dock. And when those are jacked into place, uh, there's a series of columns in that area which will come out and be replaced by columns, uh, longer uh, columns uh, that uh, take more load that will be there in order to, to, for the new loading dock area to occur there. And all of you, I think, saw that that, that walked on the, on the tour today. Uh, and then you also saw the new access ramp. This ramp has, has, was recently installed. Uh, and this is because we now have to close down our, interior, our Ontario area because we're going to build there. So now we need a new access ramp to the site, and that is the new access ramp where we are going to have access uh, on Lakeside. So we have access on Lakeside. We have access to the north of the site. And you have to have at least two access points to have sort of this uh, enter and exit strategy with trucks and other things. So that's the access ramp. Now we go north of Lakeside Avenue. 
And um, north of Lakeside Avenue, first of all, uh, the structure that still remains in place uh, to the north uh, west side, uh, and you saw that, uh, that's where our food service and commissary will be, two, two stories there, food service, kitchen on the bottom, commissary on the top. Uh, you saw that structure. You saw the ballroom area in the middle, and we actually walked down there and looked north, and of course now that knee wall is gone there. So now you can have that unobstructed view to the north, and you have an idea of what it's going to be to look out the window uh, on the north side of the ballroom and also from the pre-function area. This is a little hard to make out, but this area also exists right now. Underneath that roofed area, you'll have pre-function and meeting rooms. The open area there will be infilled, uh, and, and the new uh, exit stair area, it's actually partially covered by my red arrow, but you can see uh, uh, is the, where the arrow intersects that area, there's a little opening. That's going to be the new opening for, uh, for exit stairs, but the, the large area there will be closed up. And so all of that will be in the pre-function and meeting room area. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you can see up on the top, that's the bridge, the existing bridge to the stadium. Uh, we, will, uh, we had to demolish the stairs there, uh, but we're going to rebuild those and hopefully have an agreement where people then can, uh, during the construction phase, will be able to walk across where that blue area is, which is backfilled from Lakeside Avenue to, to go to games during the season. So that is um, a little bit uh, about, uh, well, <laughs> if necessary, or if there's a season at all. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're prepared for any eventuality. So now, so now I'm going to ask you, this is, this is the question. This is, this is your, your, after seeing all this stuff today, I'll, I'll put this question to you. Why does the convention center require these extraordinarily deep foundations while that four-story medical mart, which obviously rises much higher, only requires a pad foundation? Why do we need these deep foundations? And I'm going to show you an image which has not yet been seen publicly. Um, let me tell you what this is. And I'm showing this to make a point about the foundations, but this is a little bit of a glimpse. This is a glimpse uh, in this particular rendering. And, and once again, we haven't finalized everything about uh, the uh, every aspect of this, but this is pretty much what we're talking about. So you are now in the exhibit hall, and you are looking basically northeast in the exhibit hall. What you see there up above, the glass area up above, that is Lakeside Avenue. So people are looking in from Lakeside Avenue. They can look in and see this is the, the major exhibit hall, or the first exhibit hall, the 230,000 square feet of exhibit hall. This is the very northern part of it. You can see the overlook where they walk in off of Lakeside, look down to see the activity. You can see the escalators down on either side. You can see um, you know, uh, where people can look up and see the light. And obviously, as you go through uh, the middle there, that's how you, that's how you go north into the, uh, to where the ballroom and the meeting halls are and everything else through there. Uh, so this is a little bit of a glimpse and what you can see here, first of all, you can see the true dramatic height of the structure. You can see how wide apart these columns are. And if you ever were in the old convention center, you know you didn't have this kind of spacing. But what is dramatic here is take a look, because we space these columns so wide apart, and these columns, from a structural point of view, in order to do this and have the roof structure we have, because we're pushing a lot of steel up high, these have a, uh, they're a tree structure. You can see how how the, the tree braces out from the top of those columns. Those columns carry, obviously, a significant amount of load, because think about this, they're not just, you know, they're not holding the roof, they're holding a roof that has, that has a mall on top with earth. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of weight and load which is carried down through these columns. So why do we need these, these massive caissons that go all the way down to bedrock? Well, look at the, look at the loads that we're putting uh, in these columns throughout the system. That's why you have this kind of loading. But this is a little bit of a glimpse and an idea of the scale and the grandeur of what will be occurring. Uh, I, did, I did have to tease our architects when I saw this today because I'm going to tell you that the guy by the second column, this guy right there, if you look at him closely, he is swinging a golf club. So I don't know why he's there. I don't know uh, if they picked a guy out of the computer or if this is somebody's joke, but that guy is swinging a golf club. You look closely, you'll see that. Okay, um, and by the way, just to give you the same kind of glimpse, what would, what would it be like if we were in the base of uh, the Medical Mart uh, looking over? Uh, and this is just another you know, rendering of what the bottom level of the Medical Mart uh, might look like. Once again, we haven't finished this up. This is just conceptual. 
But you know, every time we go through renderings, we see a little bit more about what some of these spaces would be like. And that would be uh, the, the Medical Mart atrium looking north, um, just in terms of the, the vision of the space. Obviously, when you look to the right on the surface level, you're looking out to the mall. Uh, you see the stairs down. You can look down into the convention hall space or the exhibit hall space from that. That's just a little bit of tying in what you saw structurally uh, into the loads that it's going to carry. Um, so let's talk a little bit more detail about the project. Contracting and staffing. Uh, we did this, uh, we reviewed this uh, last time. I'm going to tell you nothing has changed. We're on schedule. It's the same schedule we looked at before. Uh, from a manpower loading, I showed you this manpower loading chart the last time I was here. At that time, I told you that there was uh, 145 ma man months being expended in March. That was the last month I had details for, which is to say that the average um, uh, number of men on the project per day for the entire month is about 145 people for, the enti for a day. We're now up to 185 uh, man months uh, for the project. So the average number of people on that site working during the course of a day is about 185 people. And I also told you that in summer 2012, that's going to balloon up to uh, uh, around 600, uh, perhaps more with people ultimately doing the fit out. So that's where we are as we ascend the manpower loading curve. Uh, safety, uh, to date, uh, and I'll knock on wood somewhere, we have well over 100,000 man hours which been, have been expended. We have not had uh, uh, any lost time due to accidents. So uh, I think a question was asked of me on the site as to how the project is doing in terms of safety. So I just put this in here, uh, no uh, lost time due to accidents. There have been no uh, serious accidents or even accidents that have caused anybody to lose any time on the project. So that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's been a, you know, a cut and someone has gone to the first aid area, uh, but nothing of any significance on the project. So we're doing very well in terms of safety on the project as well. Uh, economic inclusion. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see our contract goals uh, for uh, small business enterprises. Our goal was at 25% of the contracting uh, would be to SBEs. In fact, our actual to date uh, as of now is 34% of contracts are to small business enterprises, so we're well ahead of our goal. And what's interesting about that is that 38 of the subcontractors who are small business enterprises have been hired by their respective prime contractors for the first time. This is not you know, business as usual, uh, good old boy network where the same people work with the same people. This is uh, an experience where 38 small businesses are working with prime contractors that have never had a relationship with them before. That's a very good fact, and that's, that still is going extremely well. Uh, in terms of our residency requirements, we have a county residency, or I should say goal, that says we want 40% of the workers on the site uh, to be residents of Cuyahoga County. Our number right now is 54%, which is very, very good. We want 20% of the total uh, workforce to be uh, residents of the city of Cleveland. That number uh, as of today is 26%. Those numbers are through 515. Uh, we still are, we audit these numbers, so I don't have final audited numbers. These are the, uh, the numbers that we believe to be accurate as of 515. We will shortly have final audited numbers through 530, but that's the numbers that we have right now. So we're doing very well in terms of our inclusion goals. Uh, all I'm going to say on budget and cash flow is that we are um, I showed you some budget numbers last week. There have been no material changes from the last presentation other than the fact that we have expended more money uh, uh, according to our plan, uh, but we have not spent any money from the county contingency yet. Our contingency is 100% intact. We have not been forced to spend money on anything out of contingency, which is very good news, uh, and we are right on budget. Uh, we are uh, in great shape budget-wise. Um, and uh, uh, with no contingency expenditures. So everything is looking good right now from a budgetary point of view. Uh, tenants and shows, uh, I showed you this last time, um, uh, and Dave Johnson is here uh, if you want to ask a question of MMPI, but basically uh, we have 63 Medical March showroom letters of intent. They right now are in the process of finalizing their contract, and uh, they will begin shortly to convert LOIs to contracts. And if you have questions about that, uh, uh, either Mr. Johnson or Mr. Casey here, you can ask them those questions. With respect to um, conferences and shows, the last time I was here, I reported that they had 38, 33 booked conferences. They now have 38 booked conferences. I think one that they booked either today or yesterday was uh, is new on the list of examples, the Ohio Society of Association of 
of association executives. I thought that was an interesting group, uh, but uh, they booked them. So they're up to 38 conferences, conventions, and trade shows. Once again, if you have questions, they're here and they can answer those questions for you. I wanted to address one last topic, uh, and then uh, you're going to hear from Tony Coyne uh, about the mall. About the mall, but. Uh, when I was here last week, uh, la not, not last week, but from the last presentation, uh, there were several questions about uh, expansion. Uh, w you know, if, uh, uh, I shouldn't say if, when this proves to be a successful project and you determine that you uh, are looking for expansion opportunities, uh, uh, if and when there it may be a decision uh, with respect to the county administration building, uh, what type of planning uh, is there in terms of expansion. And I want to just show you a little development area study that, that demonstrates this. If you take a look uh, at the, uh, the district plan showing the development, showing the, the, the medical mart and the convention center, and I've, I, by the way, have boldly stated that the development site is the county administration building site. And I, I, I hope that's not a dramatic statement, but I make that statement because there's nothing else contiguous that could be the development site. And uh, I'm going to assume that uh, under the right circumstances, the county uh, might decide to relocate from, it, from its administration building because there are opportunities. So I'll go out on a limb and say that we have identified the current county administration building as a potential future development site. Now, what would we say about that development site if we were looking at it uh, 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 for that purpose? We'd say a couple things. Number one, we would look at Lakeside Avenue, and although, although this is not cast in stone, uh, one might suggest that there should be alignment with the north face of any building on that site uh, with public auditorium. And I'm looking here at Mr. Coyne, and I'm sure Mr. Coyne would shake his head, yes, that's, that would be a nice idea, uh, because, that's the, that, because that's, uh, that would be a concept of, of continuity there. So let's assume for sake of argument that's true. It's not to say that you couldn't have at, a, at an upper elevation something going on uh, uh, which cantilevers, but for the sake of argument, let's assume that's true. A second statement that you would assume is true is that because you have a medical mart there with windows on the one side, uh, you're going to have a setback area between any future building and there'll be a no-build area between any future development and the medical mart. So that creates an area on the left side, just as you have an area on the right side uh, with respect to setback. So of that total site, about 80,100 square feet, you would have, under any assumption, and these are the most conservative assumptions, you'd have about 60,000 available as a development footprint. And by the way, you could take other buildings or other projects in comparable urban areas, and that is uh, certainly sufficient whether or not you're talking about simply expansion of convention center activities with respect to uh, exhibit space or meeting room space, whether you're talking about hotel development, whether you're talking about hotel office development, that is a, uh, a sufficient, and, and we could plop down other comparable hotel and types of buildings onto that site and they would fit. So we have a development site uh, that is, that, that could work, uh, where we could put a, a convention center hotel or some other development. Uh, now. What would we be interested in in that development? Well, uh, let me just show you. Uh, let, me, let me first of all talk about a couple possible things. One could take on the lower levels of that, of that uh, building, and one could put parking if one wanted that in the lower levels. As a matter of fact, as part of a development deal, you could talk about the parking and who has those rights. <coughs> one could take a level of that building, and one could have contiguous meeting room space. Uh, you could have the obligation or reserve high bay space. I, I doubt uh, that you know, there would be much need for exhibit hall space. I think the me meeting room space is something that's much more important here. But one could talk about that, and then one could talk about development rights on top of that, uh, or in conjunction with that, whether you're talking about hotel office building, et cetera. So take a look, and we're going to look at two sections as to how this would line up based on our existing building. And you'll notice on this particular diagram, you have a section AA, and section AA extends through the medical mart and this new development site. You, you see line AA there? See what I'm talking about here that goes this way horizontally? And then you see a section called section BB, and that goes um, east and west 
um, and that would actually divide, go through the development site into the convention center. So let's take a look at how it would line up if we were to do a development there. Number one, so this is your north-south line, and you see how the development area would line up with the medical mart. If you wanted to combine it with the medical mart, and you can see the development area, you could see where there could be a concourse level uh, connection in blue, and you could even see where you could have a bridge at an upper level uh, someplace in the development area in blue. So that shows you how that would line up. I think more significantly, though, is the next slide, uh, and this is the BB slide uh, looking south through the development site. And this shows you exactly how this would line up with the convention center. So you see the development area, and you could imagine what these layers could be. You might imagine um, that um, the, uh, the first development area there is just a, a continuation of meeting rooms. You can imagine parking being below that. You can imagine different combinations. But what you can see there is there's an absolute a connecting passage, which is a natural patch, passage from what we're building right now that goes right into the concourse level. Uh, it's, it's there right now, and as a matter of fact, if you look at the concourse level where you have registration, that would line up exactly with our registration concourse, which is exactly the place in the building you'd want to connect. So it lines up perfectly, and literally what you're going to have there are walls, uh, uh, simply, you know, knock out the wall and, and you can plug and play this building. There's no feature there that's in the way. The building as it's currently designed is absolutely capable of, without any changes, without any design modifications of accommodating future expansion if we were to do something with the county administration building. I'm not suggesting what you should do with the county administration building. Uh, I'm not, you know, going to start talking about that. All I want to say is that the current plan for the Convention Center and Medical Mart is set up in such a way that it naturally accommodates future expansion on the county administration site, and you can see how that does it. So that's the only purpose of this study, just to show you that we don't have a problem, we don't have an issue, it actually welcomes it, and it could be done. It could be done very easily um, in the future. So that, that's the purpose of that, of that study. So at this point in time, uh, before I, I introduce Tony, uh, do you have any questions of anything that I showed? You had a full day of this stuff. Uh, uh, Mr. Schwann? Uh, yes, you indicated you developed one site. Is there uh, a contingency plan that would develop additional sites when, when the um, successes continue to roll? Uh, considering the fact that we don't right now actually, I mean, the county has control of that site. Uh, I mean, there are plans and there are, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussion about activities in the, in the in public auditorium, which is a whole different conversation because there is, there's all sorts of ways that public auditorium fits into these plans. But other than that, we have not talked about any other site as an expansion site. A, there's no other contiguous site, and B, there's certainly no other site uh, that the county controls or could control. So that is, that is the contiguous expansion site. It's, it's, it's putting activities, you know, working in conjunction with the city at public auditorium or that expansion site. Those are the two most logical things to do in terms of expansion. Is there a reason why the setback has to be there other than to have a setback? Is, there, is it possible to connect the, to the medical bar at some uh, point to, to gain that floor space and the additional square footage at some point? The, the, the issue with that is right now, the way the medical mart is designed uh, is the medical mart has windows on that side. I mean, it's very important in terms of light and the functionality of the medical mart. So right now, that side of the building has windows and you would not, you know, you would have to redo that plan. I mean, you know, theoretically that could happen, but you would then be changing the whole design of the medical mart because uh, right now it's designed with windows on that side. It has a curtain wall on that side. Uh, the tenants on that side, you know, obviously need light, need access. So uh, that would be that would be a, f a fairly radical. Okay. It's so not to say it couldn't be done, but that that's a that's a that's a pretty radical change for the current design. Okay. Um, and, and in the Leeds, uh, Leeds Silver, uh, does that have value in convention marketing? Um. Here, where's our convention marketers? I mean, just does Leeds Silver certification have value in convention marketing? I, I'm, I'm not an expert. You are. Yes, no. 
<laughs> yes, no? Well, I guess. Why don't, you, why don't you speak to Mike? Hi, my name is uh, Brian Casey. I'm general manager of the uh, Cleveland Medical Martin Convention Center. Um, it is becoming more and more important with trade show organizers uh, for buildings and, and actually the way they conduct their shows to have lead certification. Uh, the greening of trade shows is taking on more and more importance, and so this will be a, a critical attraction for what we're doing here. I was just in Chicago and uh, visited the Merchandise Mart in uh, Chicago, and um, they have an amazing recycling uh, program already in place. So um, MMPI knows how to do these things, and so I think what uh, Jeff is explaining here is, is going to be a real benefit to our ability to attract new shows to Cleveland. Um, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you. Actually, uh, a tenant question. Tenant question. Since we uh, last met, about a, well, over a year ago, I gave Mr. Madden uh, information on HIMSS, and they have announced that they're going to Nashville. Uh, were we even in the ballgame here? Uh, HIMSS, uh, certainly. We talked to uh, the organization you're talking about. Is, um, they, uh, they, were, they were discussed. Uh, they were pitched the same... Uh, same project as uh, as our other 63 tenants, and they chose to go elsewhere. But uh, at this point, I would say there are, uh, by category, there are eight uh, medical device development and design firms. There are 16 medical device and technology companies, 10 healthcare IT firms, all four major hospital systems here in Northeast Ohio, uh, the clinic, UH, Metro Health, and Sisters of Charity. Uh, local healthcare industry leaders such as BioEnterprise, BioOhio, and Team Neo, uh, healthcare communication companies, uh, Vendome and MedCity News, healthcare education, so uh, all the uh, significant uh, educational institutions in this area, and then 14 healthcare design and furnishing companies. Uh, and among the big names, uh, although the one that uh, uh, Mr. Gallagher mentioned is not a part of us at this point, uh, some of the names uh, you might recognize, Johnson Controls, Invicare, Steris, Clariant, Blue Star, Highland Software, MCPC, and of course uh, our hospital provider systems here. Well, while I understand that, Hims brings the New York Yankees of IT with them, and I'm wondering why they would sign on with Nashville, who really can't start building until they get a certain percentage signed, and pass up Cleveland. This I is this so. is a real swing and miss, and I'm I, trying I, to figure out. I think that's how a that swing happened. and I think that's a swing and miss on their part. We certainly made that presentation to that organization, but uh, uh, I would address that question to that organization. Uh, to answer your question, you're right. This is I think a swing and miss on their part, and we well, uh, when these are the, the Yankees right swinging and missing, and I'm, and I'm. I just can't wrap my hands around this. I mean, could, could you tell me how we went after them, how aggressive we were? I mean, they bring, uh, well, you mentioned great companies, Cisco, Google, Microsoft, and 380 corporate members. I mean, that's, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's what you're looking at as, a, as an anchor tenant. We don't seemingly have an anchor tenant yet. Well, I would dispute that. I think we have several companies that I would consider anchor tenants, uh, tenants that I just mentioned. I mean, Johnson Controls, Invicare, Steris. To me, those square, are anchor tenants. How much square footage are they going to be leasing? Those are the types of things we're currently working on with each of those companies. Um, In your opinion, what's a, what, what would an anchor company lease? What do you have to lease to be an anchor company? Well, I think an anchor tenant would certainly look, uh, you know, you'd be looking at probably something with a, a one or a two in front of it in terms of square footage. So it wouldn't be, uh, you know, a couple hundred feet or a couple thousand feet. It would probably be significantly larger than that. Because they're at least in 25,000. I don't know. I, I, you know what? I've always questioned uh, this aspect of it and how aggressive we are, and it seems like we're, we should be in the lead and that in my opinion doesn't put us in the lead when when hymns walks away from you that's huge and i i've got a problem with that i appreciate really your concern i would just say respectfully that's one example and i would 
point out that we, uh, across the healthcare industry, have remarkable balance. Uh, that's one organization, but I think, as I just mentioned, we have remarkable balance across the healthcare industry, that it's not just one aspect of the industry, it's all aspects of the industry. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. It, all set? Okay, at this point in time, I think uh, we're going to bring uh, Tony Coyne up. Uh, Mr. Coyne uh, works really with us in two capacities, his normal capacity with the, which he'll describe uh, briefly with city planning uh, and design review. Uh, he has a special role that the mayor assigned to him with respect to uh, the group plan commission, which is what he's here to talk about today. Just to remind you uh, of our, and I, we started into this at the last meeting, uh, the development uh, agreement and the deal that we have, basically we control and manage and uh, the convention center, uh, the medical mart. There is an easement for the city uh, to operate uh, the park, in essence, up above, uh, which is you know mall, which are the malls up above, we agreed, and we have provided a a very good baseline design, which you have seen in the past. Uh, and uh, this baseline design creates a wonderful green mall. Uh, we we are investing uh, something over 21 million dollars into that baseline design, which is a which is a great mall design, which is going to give us the function that we need up above. Uh, however, uh, the Group Plan Commission uh, has the ability, and the city had the, has the ability to make additional improvements and do additional things on top. Uh, the Group Plan Commission uh, has the assignment by, by the city to, to, to work on those issues, and that's what Tony's here to talk about. So, um, and Tony, you're going to use your own computer here, right? Yeah. First okay. Rip that out. It's all yours. Thank you. That's right. That's yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is uh, Tony Coyne. I'm uh, chair of the Cleveland Planning Commission. I've been on the Cleveland Planning Commission for, for 20 years. I've worked under three different mayors. I've chaired the commission now for almost 10 years. Um, briefly, uh, this whole concept of the Group Plan Commission uh, resulted from a discussion I had with, with Mayor Jackson uh, over a year ago. And I'm going to present some history. And I'll try not to bore you, so feel free to interrupt me if that helps. Before I start, I want to thank a few people that are also here, here with me today. Um, Linda Henriksen is a senior planner with the Cleveland Planning Commission. She was a senior planner and worked on the Gateway Project with the county and the city of Cleveland, also the Cleveland Brown Stadium, and several other substantial projects in, in our city. Also with me is um, Ann Zoller, who is the executive director of Park Works, and I would call her one of the top park advocates in the state of Ohio and their organization is one of the greatest park advocacy organizations and we're really fortunate to have them in Cleveland. They, uh, along with Cleveland Public Art and along with the planning staff, really staffed the work of the Group Plan Commission. I will pass out at the end our report which has just been published uh, and it is the report of the Group Plan Commission, so I'll make sure that you all get a copy before I leave. What I handed out, however, now was uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to discuss with you here this afternoon. Uh, the Group Plan Commission consists of approximately 14 members. They're identified uh, in the PowerPoint. I'm not going to mention all of them. It's a very diverse group of Clevelanders, greater Clevelanders, and they were put together with the consultation with, I said, Mayor Jackson and Mayor Jackson's leadership. The, the group plan itself, and I know that we've talked about the convention center and the group plan is a significant part of our convention infrastructure. The group plan was established at the beginning of the last century, and I, I think it's important that we talk about that because 
if you look at the group plan, it was established as an idea in 1899. Mayor Johnson became mayor of the city of Cleveland in 1901. The commission was formed in 1902. And it really was, at, its, at the time, significant. Significant in the sense that they were adopting, uh, melding together the City Beautiful movement and the Progressive movement. Uh, by the time Mayor Johnson was done with his term in office, Cleveland was the best governed city in America. And we were considered to be one of the most prosperous cities in the country. Uh, Mayor Johnson, uh, and, and I might add, in 1903, Cleveland's population was the same as it is today which is kind of interesting. So maybe our brightest, brightest days are still ahead of us. But at the time, uh, Mayor Johnson, along with the governor of the state of Ohio, established the Group Plan Commission. And three, three members of the commission were appointed. They were all well-known architects and planners. Uh, Daniel Burnham is the most well-known, who, as you may know, did the White City in Chicago, which was part of the World's Columbian Exposition in, in 1893. John Career worked on the um, the Pan American Exposition, which was similar to that in Buffalo a few years later. And those three architects were really the visionaries for the group plan. They traveled the world and looked at great urban centers throughout the world. And I might add with Daniel Burnham, a piece of history that's significant, this collection of government buildings on this mall is unparalleled outside of Washington, D.C. It's an unparalleled set of government buildings in the entire country. So it's a huge historic location, in addition to being surrounded by historic buildings. And other than his work in Chicago, his initial work in Cleveland is considered to be uh, some of the most significant urban planning um, developments in the country. And as you may or may not know, the Group Plan Commission in 1903 evolved into Cleveland's Planning Commission, the first planning commission in the country. Now, Burnham had a view of big plans. He had a view of really looking at the big picture and try to uh, create a city using the concepts that were developed in the great gardens and parks and government structures in Europe. So this was the concept that they had to work with and they worked on the plan for a period of, of about um, uh, five years. The plan itself was adopted in uh, 1903 and the initial plan had its cornerstone or the most significant potential structure was its train station on the lakefront, which never got built. It's one of the few buildings that did not get built as part of the group plan. Um, the group plan uh, was developed, and I don't know how well this comes out, but that, that actually was a modification of the plan in the 20s. And this is when they first started to plan for Cleveland Brown Stadium. They were trying to get the Olympics. And so the, the concept of the plan really began to evolve throughout the 20s. It took really two decades for most of the structures to be developed and built. So that is um, a significant part of the history. And for purposes of history as well, the, um, the leadership of the group plan at the time was started out with, with Mayor, um, Mayor Johnson. But his view of politics and civic life was really molded by Henry George, who was a progressive at the time, who also was a, uh, was a uh, contemporary of John Lincoln. And John C. Lincoln founded Lincoln Electric in Euclid. And they really were the people looking at the greater good of Cleveland as a great industrialized city. And for what it's worth, uh, John Lincoln's granddaughter, Katie Lincoln, is on the Group Plan Commission with us today. She lives in Scottsdale, Arizona. She came to all of our meetings. She participated actively. She chairs and, ru and runs the uh, Lincoln Land Institute in Cambridge, which is the largest land use think tank in the country. So I thought that was a significant addition to our commission in making it diverse in terms of, of people in general. So the group plan, as the buildings were developed in 1911, the federal building, which was considered the, po the post office, in 1935, uh, eventually it, was, it became the site of the uh, Great Lakes uh, Exposition. But all of the buildings were developed as originally laid out by Daniel Burnham, on access and uh, in configuration of great public spaces. Now, I want to fast forward quickly as to why this is so important, why this is so important for Greater Cleveland. This is a major opportunity for Greater Cleveland. We brought together a great group of people to try to advance creating not just a great public park or great public space, but something which would transform and change downtown Cleveland for hopefully the greater good of Greater Cleveland. This is Cleveland's part 
of the convention center. The convention center, and I, I've been on various iterations of the convention center my years on the planning commission, it was always difficult to get traction because the people that go to conventions don't necessarily live in the city in which they go to the convention. So trying to get interest has always been a challenge. We've, we've overcome that with a business plan, with a medical mart, and with the desire to try to reinvest in our convention center infrastructure. But now we have to look at the Cleveland part of this project. Other great cities in this country have invested heavily in their downtown park core. And I don't mean insignificantly or, or when I say heavily, I mean millions of dollars have gone into their downtown park. And it's been done through a variety of partnerships, public-private partnerships and philanthropic endeavors. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle uh, went in with the help of both foundations and significant private investment, which is now the link to the ocean from the city of Seattle. Cantilevers over some rail, railroad lines and also a highway system. And it's, it's all done and has created and catalyzed development around that part of their downtown. Other locations, uh, Chicago's Millennium Park, probably the gold standard for parks in this country. $490 million park and 25 acres of land in downtown Chicago. $490 million. Half of it raised publicly, half of it raised privately. That park has generated, it's estimated over $1.4 billion in real estate development around it. And to give you an idea, to put this in the perspective, that park is approximately 25 acres in size. The Group Plan Commission, looking at Public Square and the mall, malls A, B, and C, is about 24 acres. So we're looking at significant public space nearly the size of Millennium Park in Chicago. Other cities, again, who have done this, and if you're familiar with the High Line in New York, it's a park built over a railroad trellis in New York, in uh, Manhattan. That $170 million project has generated redevelopment along a, a mile and a quarter line of railroad track that's elevated, and it's actually an elevated park, and it's created significant development in, in Manhattan. They estimate over $900 million of other investment will be in place within the next two decades. Fountain Square in Cincinnati, again, a $50 million reinvestment in the central part of Cincinnati, and again, to spur development around it. Boston, the Rose Kennedy Greenway, near the, the famous you know, big dig in, in Boston. That also is a new downtown park in, in, in Boston, which has created significant development around it. In Bryant Park, again in New York, uh, a renovated park um, which has created significant reinvestment in older condominiums in that part of, of Manhattan. Centennial Olympic Park, which has been restored in Atlanta, the same thing. Uh, and City Garden, which I just visited recently in St. Louis, is about a five-acre park that was privately done for about $45 million. It has $15 million of public art in, in the heart of uh, St. Louis uh, and, and he has he had significant impact on adjacent properties being redeveloped within walking distance of the parks. The city of St. Louis, very similar to Cleveland in some respects, has significant uh, reinvestment in downtown loft living. Again, walking distance from this park. And I will also tell you that recently, and I haven't been there, but Columbus has just opened up a new uh, park downtown, 20 acres on the former city center mall that was, which was demolished, uh, and, and that was just dedicated recently. The commission was formed in 2010, the group plan commission itself, in June. We held eight meetings, they're all open to the public, and we had 40 meetings of working groups. We had four working groups, and I'll tell you a little bit about their, their conclusions, planning and urban design, public participation and community engagement, governance and implementation and finance. Our draft recommend, recommendations were completed in the middle of February. We had a 30-day comment period, and we published our report, which I'll be handing uh, to you this, this afternoon. Each working group worked on their own with the direction of the chair. The working group for planning and urban design was chaired by David Abbott, and they worked with addressing the mall, public square, and the connection to the lakefront. Again, this was our mall before the construction, which Jeff Applebaum ably showed you, this is what we had. In some ways, it's very nice, but there's a lot of hardscape. There's also a failure in that the buildings around it had their back doors to the mall. A big reason the space was dead is that the mall back doors didn't accommodate people going there. And so unless you were walking through the mall, it never was a successful public space. 
And the Planning Commission, I give the Planning Commission my colleagues a lot of credit, we worked very hard with MMPI and the county to make sure that the doors opened up onto the mall. And future development, especially if there's an opportunity to do something with the, uh, the county administration building in a future development site, it should open up out onto the mall so that that space gets activized and energized as it was originally intended to do with, again, you know, there was gonna be a great entranceway through a train station on the lakefront. So when you got off a train or if you got off a, a, a boat at the train station because they were integrating different transportation, you would walk into Cleveland that way. That's how you were introduced to Cleveland. So when you look at the Civic Center of Cleveland, it is the mall and Public Square. And if you look at the different districts downtown that we're focusing on as a city to redevelop for housing, for retail, for entertainment, for new office, for mixed use, this is the center of the city. And this is the center of our region. So we've looked at how to connect that. And if you look at this particular um, diagram, this shows you the eventual build out. If all the projects that are currently on the, on the books for Cleveland get done, they all surround a five minute walk or 10 minute walk, I should say, of the mall and public square. And it's a significant reinvestment. These projects are catalytic, but the group plans recommendation is likewise catalytic. When you look at the investments that are being made currently privately in our city, it's significant. We're pushing $2 billion of private investment in our city and along with public infrastructure improvements, including the convention center and the Interbelt Bridge. The mall itself is to be a way to connect to the lakefront. The convention center, as you know, will overlook the lakefront from Mall B because of the elevation, but we have to do more than that. We have to figure out how to connect to our lakefront, how to make sure we focus our city on reconnecting to the lakefront and advocating for um, our development of our lakefront. And you have to do that through a better pedestrian way than 9th Street, West 3rd, and uh, all fairness to the connection to the Brown Stadium, not acceptable handicapped access whatsoever to the Brown Stadium from that part of the mall. It's completely inaccessible if you have any kind of a disability. So we have to improve that connection if we're gonna really reclaim our region as being a green city on a blue lake. And that's a big part of our, our goal. This currently shows you what's in the baseline budget if Tony Coyne and the 14 members of the Group Plan Commission go home and do nothing. And if, if this community doesn't wanna do anything, this is what you get, a very nice green space with a great overlook of the lakefront, no connection to the lakefront, but no connection to public square, no redevelopment of public square. So this is what you get. And I gotta tell you, I'm not being critical of that. It's not bad. The design that LMN and GGN have done is not bad. I think that will be a much improved mall than what we had when we started this construction project. But the key uh, recommendations that we have uh, are significant to green the mall up, to try to make it more amenable, to activities, whether they're recreational, passive in nature, or more active in nature. So we studied with GGN, the landscape architectural firm from uh, Seattle, uh, all elements of, of the mall. And we focused specifically on malls A, B, and C. And again, I'll, I'll digress a little bit and move ahead. When we, we look at our private sector opportunities for raising money, we've retained a firm and I have to thank the county and, the, and the, the administration for providing some assistance to a study that's being undertaken for naming rights and sponsorship dollars so we can have private sector investments. It's kind of ridiculous that our town has mall A, B, and C. Every other community, it would be Key Plaza, PNC Plaza, Huntington Plaza, whatever you, you want to call it, and there'd be a price tag on it. And the folks at RTA know how valuable the Healthline name and the Cleveland Clinic's commit, Cleveland Clinic commitment to the Healthline is. So we have to be innovative in how we raise our money because we know times are tough. So we've looked at how to have walking paths, bicycle loops, uh, healthy streets throughout the mall site itself. And we looked at every aspect to the mall from, again, Mall A, doing innovative things uh, and to address the grade changes on Mall B. You know, Mall B will be out of the ground at different levels from uh, six feet at the southern end to 27 feet at the northern end. So we have to address how to make those spaces interesting. We have a plan to, to develop what are called urban rooms, which is sort of a park and planning concept to create intimate small parks 
in the mall itself so that you could have a space where you'd have maybe a, a, a garden space, a formal garden, maybe an art element, a small fountain, a splash park for kids, whatever it might be. And we're still going through that whole process as to how to do that. So these are very much conceptual recommendations. For mall uh, C, uh, and I hate to even call them these because it's, it, sh it shows you that we haven't come far enough in some respects, but mall C uh, would have a, we recommend a, a significant fountain element and also some active space, possibly some um, basketball courts, possibly a park, possibly a playground area on Mall C. And again, overlooking the lake would be one of our goals. We want to provide activity zones on the north end being more active, uh, a little more community-based in the center. It would be a great location for, for concerts, for example, because of the grade change. It makes for a natural amphitheater and maybe something more of a, uh, 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 on, the, on Mall A, a location for some of the food trucks to gather so that people can have different venues to eat and actually do something on the mall. The big ideas that have been generated, uh, which we think are significant, is a, uh, an iconic pedestrian connection bridge to the lakefront, probably connecting the north east side of the mall to the Rock and Hall of Fame or Science Center. And again, not yet designed. Conceptually, that would be the location. We would be looking for naming rights and public dollars to try to do that and accomplish that. That's one of the most, and again, this is all done through public input that we received over our period of, of, of a year in, in planning this project. Uh, the other is the transformation of Public Square. We've commissioned a traffic study to be undertaken. We're using a, a firm called Nelson Nygaard, who've done some work for RTA as it relates to their uh, transit-oriented development program, and they're a very well-regarded, innovative, uh, transit uh, traffic engineering firm to address how to do things a little bit differently, to install smart streets so that you could have safe bicycle traveling, so that you can have pedestrian ways that are better within your downtown and not simply have uh, a public square that ends up being a 10-acre depot. And we're looking at possibly closing uh, Ontario as a part of that and rerouting some of our, our bus system. Uh, that's a concept that was done through a public process that occurred just before the group plan commission began meeting. Uh, and this, this particular proposal, by the way, was done by a firm named uh, uh, James Corner and Associates field, fr fr field Operations from New York who did, who did the, uh, the uh, High Line in, in New York City. And I, and I will tell you that we're trying to make this bigger than just the mall as well. We're looking at doing improvements to our street grid downtown, Lakeside and St. Clair in particular, to connect the development in the flats with what Ernst & Young is doing and the Tucker Ellis building that's going in, all the way to the Avenue District, which is at 12th Street. 12th Street has an overlay zoning district. It's all gonna be <coughs> developed eventually as mixed use uh, residential. So how to connect that for people living downtown, working downtown, recreating downtown, wanting to be downtown. And, and these are uh, some of the concepts of a bigger version of what we're trying to do with the street grid. We're also looking at closing off East Third Street, uh, or East Second Street, no, it's East Third Street, uh, to make that a grand entranceway to the mall from Superior Avenue. So we're pulling the mall closer into downtown so it becomes a better connection into downtown. Um, this just shows the water features that we've tried to identify as our, part of our process. Again, looking at uh, Mall C having a water feature and, and East Third Street potentially having um, a location for winter uh, ice rinks. We're looking at infrastructure improvements and, and we're working to address this hopefully with some baseline add-ons with your, your um, um, uh, engineering firms. And we're not there yet, but to make sure that we can accommodate conduit for, for Wi-Fi accessibility throughout the park. It's done in other cities. It should be done in Cleveland. And we want to have the infrastructure in place because this could take one, two, five, 10, 15 years to actually implement. But we have to make sure that we 